This is tuna on toast. See, I got this new green room all ready to go just for Josh. Oh, I think that's him. Who is it? It's Josh. Yeah! So masked up with the orange shoes, ready to go. I guess we're not, uh, none of these anymore. You can uh, wear it if you want. You don't well, want no, to wear it. How's it going? <laughs> Everything's <laughs> great. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for having me. Uh, hey, before we jump in there, first of all, I got a new green room. This is just for you. Any snacks you would like? Uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. I just okay. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's just go over here real quick. Again. I filled this up just because you're present. I don't know what you like. I don't know if you want an avocado, yogurt, liquids. Give me the avocado. Do you want the no, avocado? Okay. Okay. <laughs> a high noon. I don't know if you ever read that. Whoa. Spin drift. Do you want anything? I'll, I'll, I'll try one of those uh, beer looking waters. Okay. <laughs> it's, there's vodka in here. No, no, no this oh. one. Oh, the liquid death. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. go for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I don't know. There's, there's still it's such a novelty to me. Yes. Drink water out of, out of a can. I don't know if it helps the environment. I don't know if the water's good. It's good. It's cold. I like it better than box water. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yeah. Box water. Yes. Yeah. I like Sorry it. for those of you in the box water industry. <laughs> Many Tuna on Toast listeners and viewers are in the box water industry. Well, I know it says very boldly on the, on the box, box water is better. I mean, it's just kind of like anything. If it has to be advertised like that. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. <sighs> All right. You ready to do a podcast? Mm-hmm. All right, watch your head, watch your feet. Josh will sit right there. I'll sit right here. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for being here. Oh, man. I can't believe you're at my house. You ready to start this? <laughs> yeah. Three, two, one, let's go. Everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tuna on Toast. I am Ted Stryker, joined by an incredible artist in so many different ways. Josh Klinghoffer is at my house. Josh! <laughs> striker, 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 striker. <laughs> Very good. How are you, man? I'm okay. <laughs> I, it's always like a crazy trip to me when a musician comes over, whether it's Brett Gerwitz or Tom DeLonge or Mike Shinoda, and here you are driving here where you're like, why am I going to this idiot's house? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I, I grew up listening to you on the radio. Are you serious? Uh, yeah. So you're from the Valley area? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm from... I grew up in Northridge. I mean, I first I was born in Santa Monica. I lived in Canoga Park, then Northridge, and now I live in Pasadena, which is where Pasadena is. We love <laughs> Pasadena, but growing up out in the Valley, I believe the Valley is underrated when it comes to like the history of musicians that come from the area, because there's a long, long list of great people. Uh, yeah, I th they're probably, I mean, it, gosh, it might be more extensive than I even know because uh, I, I probably spent more time investigating other places rather than where I was from. But yeah, I mean, certainly people move to the valley later on, too. Right. And why do they move to the valley later on? Is it because there's a CPK and a frozen yogurt within a mile of each probably, other? Probably, probably. <laughs> what kind of frozen yogurt? Penguins, maybe? Uh, pe oh, my God. I used to <laughs> love penguins. I love... Um, there's still a penguins near my house. There, there's a penguin still yeah. out there? Uh-huh. And Yeah. At least last I checked. <laughs> When's the last time you had frozen yogurt? You know, the last time I tried frozen yogurt from that penguins, I I went, I took one one taste, and I was like, eh -eh. like <laughs> it's not it's not 1987 anymore. Right, I'm done. What led you to get into music as a young person living out there in the valley, as opposed to maybe playing sports or being a sculptor or a painter? What the heck was it? Um. Let's see. Well, I um, K Rock didn't play, uh, didn't have a sculpt, a sculpture show, right? <laughs> <Or> yes, <a laughs> painting show. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I I've been saying this a lot lately. I don't know how it sounds, but I, you know, I I feel like I'm the age uh, that caught the tail end of the analog world. So I was all about the radio. Um, I didn't, I, I, uh, we didn't have cable most of my childhood, so mm. I would see it at my grandparents' house. So it was always such a treat, MTV and, and K-Rock and any of the radio stations here in LA, uh, but particularly K-Rock. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I mean, that, that was my connection to the, to the outside world. My, my father, my parents both liked music a lot. My dad had a big record collection. Really? Yeah. What was his record collection like? Beach Boys, Beatles, Ex Zeppelin? Exactly that. Oh, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that I mean, all over the map. I think my mother would 
uh, sneak a couple in. I remember, yeah, Beach Boys, Beatles were sort of two of my earliest discoveries you know, via my my parents. Um, but Culture Club, I remember we had really playing because that you know early eighties. Wow. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course, so that, that Boy was George Culture Club. Yeah, fascinating to me the the difference in the sound from the stuff that I think my parents generally listen to more of, which would have been sixties and seventies music. If you listen to a Culture Club song now, I believe that some of those songs. It's not necessarily like I stand so strong that they hold up, but they're good songs. Oh, they're amazing. They're put together really well, hooky as can be, catchy, and it's like, you know what? This is good. It is, yeah. To me, it was never not good. I mean, they, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, again, to talk about the age, I mean, to have, you know, maybe 60s, 70s music be some of the first music you hear, and then the 80s, all the experimentation sonically that was going on in the early 80s i mean i remember being a kid i remember specifically walking around the queen mary in yes. long beach yeah and contemplating the sound of the snare drum that i just heard on the radio and it was something like culture club it was something like that but i was just thinking like that that just doesn't sound like the normal sound so wow. i don't only think of that now but i mean it just the, that that era you know the the right. kind of experimentation that was going on you know, in recordings and stuff like that was pretty mind blowing, I think, to a young, a young, a uh, young listener. So who were some of the artists, whether they were right in your wheelhouse with your taste or maybe you just respected, like, I guess it would be late 80s into the mid to late 90s. Who were you like, wow, this is so good. Uh, well, I, I had a cousin that was really into Morrissey. And oh. so and so, like kind of far before I even really, you know, kind of became obsessed with that music i saw i saw him as a character that was just the coolest looking person i'd seen in a while so and right. then when coming back to la because they all lived in the east coast on the uh, yeah on the east coast um i sort of noticed that i didn't have an older sibling but i called that older sibling music so all the cooler older people were into depeche mode and morrissey and especially here in la and it was right. all centered around you know listening to k-rock and um Yes. Uh, so, I mean, those bands I could say earlier on, but I was a kid and I was also taken with uh, the stuff on pirate radio. Right. Uh, pirate radio. <laughs> Absolutely. Guns N' Roses. And, yes. Uh, you know, all, uh, stuff like that. ACDC I liked as a kid. Um, Molly Crew, I have to admit. <laughs> well, Molly Crew, when I hear Motley Crue songs now, and so I think I was, I was too young to get into Motley Crue when they were became popular in the 80s. And so I never went to one of their concerts, but I feel like if I would have been 22 years old, I would have been at one of those shows probably going way too bananas. Well, you would have probably had fun. See, I was a uh, I was about 7. Okay. They, I mean, it was I guess it's kind of like, you know, from what I hear when people would get into Kiss when they were really young, you know, and they were I mean, I wasn't I when when I was uh let's see how like, you know, 8 or 9 and Dr. Feelgood was the next album that came yes. out. And there was just single after single, and it was on the radio and on the TV all the time. And, yeah. And I had just started playing music myself, and I was a drummer. And, you know, Tommy would twiddle those sticks. Right. It was just yes. like watching a, a circus performer. What did your folks say uh, when you said to them, Mom, Dad, you know, thanks for playing all the Beach Boys and all this music. Uh, I, want, I want to play the drums. Uh well, I, I've told this story before, and I, this is how I remember it. I, I hadn't decided whether it was drums or guitar that I wanted to pursue, and my mother, oddly, just signed me up for drums. She must have thought that I had made that decision, but I didn't really uh, come to that decision myself. I was still sort of dawdling and walking around the music shop, yeah, um, Canoga Music in the Valley. Oh, cool. And, uh, and, uh, and, yeah, she said, you know, your, le- your first lesson is Wednesday or whatever it was, and it was drums. So I started taking drum lessons <laughs> For a little while, but you know, I don't think she really even thought, you know, what that w- what that decision would would mean, you know, three or four years down the road with all the you know all the weekend practices and the stuff that you had to endure as the parent of a drummer. Right, but if you look at some athletes at thirteen, fourteen years old, who's gung ho about playing sports, and the parents are gung ho, of course, they're driving them to San Francisco for the weekend basketball tournament or the girls softball tournament down San Diego, whatever. So maybe it's equivalent having a kid that's into sports and music. Yeah. And no, it's like, I, kudos to your mom for doing that. That's yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, I've, those kind of realizations dawn on me, you know, daily, especially at this stage of my life. I don't have kids, but I, you know, 
especially with the joke I just made about, you know, what it sounds like to have that coming out. Because they were always good about that. I mean, they would complain when I'd have, you know, the full <laughs> band come over and just make, you know, a racket. But, yeah, I think I think for the most part, they were uh, they were supportive. Who the hell was coming in your house and how old were you? Not named, but like, was this high school bands? Were you like, guys, let's go to my house and do this? Yeah, younger than that. I mean, I started oh, really? playing drums when I was nine. So it was from <laughs> nine till, you know, I guess sort of 14 or 15. Because when uh, around 15, I sort of put the drums down for a bit. And that's when I learned guitar. I started focusing more on guitar. Did you have guitar lessons? No, no. I just, oh I just kind of, I was sick of, I was sick of having you know, being under 16 and needing rides with the drums. So I was like, ah, I got to do something about this. <laughs> you mentioned at the top of the interview that you didn't have an older sibling, but the music was like your older brother. Throughout your career, from my vantage point, a lot of you, the people that you have worked with are much older than you. Yeah, yeah. Is there like a, a reason professionally that happened or is it psychologically? What was gravitating you towards them and them towards you? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think, I mean, it all started with Bob Forrest and then another, my bicycle sh- thief. Bi- yeah. And, and he was in Thelonious Monster yes. in the eighties and early nineties and part of a larger scene here in LA that I was too young to really know about at the time or obviously be a part of. But, um, when he sort of, uh, got, you know, left his former life behind and was sober now and wanted to do some music, his girlfriend at the time whose brother is still one of my dearest and closest friends, she, she just said, you know, you should, you should play with this kid that lives around the corner from my parents right? and, you know, my brother's friend. You yeah. know? Um, and I said this to someone recently. He called and left a message, and I, we started playing and hanging out. I was 17, and he was 38 or 37. And, you know, I, I don't see myself hanging out with a 17-year-old now. You right. know, I'm 42 so, yeah, um, you know, thankfully he, thankfully he took that chance, and thankfully I was mature enough to, you know, not be a complete embarrassment. Um, but yeah, we started playing, and I think maybe because of the fact that I was always so young and around him, and then around this person and that person, and sort of I was always, especially then, incredibly shy. And mm. you know, I even I think of it as having to have this conversation with myself at some point. Like this is you're gonna, this is not gonna serve you well to continue to be this shy. But I think I just sort of have always been the type of person that can walk into a room and sort of evaluate the situation or the people around and kind of maybe serve what needs being, you know, kind of serve the situation or serve the people and what they might need to, to succeed. So in in that, that might be a a window into why it's always been, uh, it's always I, I've always been someone that can kind of get along and play with other older people and you know because I just sort of I I, uh, I respect them and I I sort of defer to them in a lot of ways and I sort of you know not that I always agree with everything everyone says but I I sort of trust their instincts particularly back then and I'm just sort of there to make you know I'm sure it comes with a lot of, comes from a lot of insecurity as well back then yeah uh, yeah especially but yeah I think I'm just you know. I sort of uh, I appreciate all the wonderful things that these people have done, and I just want to I want to I want to so be cool, uh, next to it. And I want right. to learn from it. Right at seventeen, though eighteen, even nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. If you line up a thousand twenty-year-olds, how many of them are going to show up on time to a practice? Oh well, a well, you, uh, <laughs> you could ask Bob about that too. I, I wasn't always on time, <laughs> but see, that was because I was coming from Northridge. So I always, I, it took me well into my late thirties to sort of really get it through my mind that you needed to, uh, you know, you needed to plan for the drive. I was always too irresponsible for that I'm right like, okay I'm doing something <laughs> i don't care if it's gonna take me an hour to, and a half to get there I'm, I'm gonna you know i'll leave in a bit yeah so i was not i was not always on time um when you f- are working playing music with bob forrest who went through a lot in life to get to his sober life and it's a lot of work to stay sober does a 17 18 year old understand what journey that particular person has been on um I don't know if I understood at the time, 
like I like I would now. But I, I remember at that time he was newly sober, so there was lots of you know, le- like less than a year, I, if I remember correctly. So there was lots of, um, you know, there were there were days that were harder than others, and I remember you know there being a lot of worries, perhaps if things weren't going right in the world around him. But um, yeah, I definitely understand it more. But, uh, you know, I have uh, other experience with that. So I was aware of, Mm. you know, the concept of sobriety and and what it, you know, what it means to someone and and all that. Yeah, I wasn't completely new to that. So as you're getting into your early 20s, professionally, uh, or did did you actually feel like a professional at that point? And or did and did your folks ever say, or you know, uh, listen, um, you're a really smart guy. We understand you're pretty good at guitar, but uh, what's what's the plan here? Um, well, I'm sure they said that all the time. <laughs> I didn't listen much because I didn't finish high school, so we were sort of, <laughs> I would say, either um, we were in that conversation for a long time. Um, from when I was 15 on, and it was it was a bloody battle at times. But I think because mm. I made the um decision to stop going to school which wasn't really a decision like a for like i didn't put much forethought into it it was just sort of it just happened one day kind of based on the attendance policies we had at mm-hmm. that time i just didn't go i stopped going so uh yeah because there was that that fight i think it sort of ma- it, it made me uh it, it made me promise myself that i had to succeed in some way right so right you know um yeah uh so there, there wasn't much talk of that stuff because um, <laughs> the, it wasn't much of a dialogue. It was, you know, I don't think my parents or I knew how to communicate with each other very well. So it was, it was lots of um, digging in of heels and and hurling of insults and oh, you know, see man. how much blood can be drawn. And you know, not not to say that was a a, a good thing in any way, but I think it did it did it did make me realize how serious I had to be in order to maybe win that fight. <laughs> so do you think professionally, even at the age you are now, you're still proving yourself to them? Uh, perhaps. I mean, I'm definitely still proving myself to myself mm. and probably, yeah, proving myself to them. But them, I think, is sort of a, you know, like a... Um, See, there's a better word that I should, you know, maybe if I'd finished school, I would know. Here, but <laughs> they're kind of, it, the, them is a stand in for the entire world. You know, I, I, I gotcha. sort of, I, you know, proving myself to society at large who, you know, you're just brought up to feel like a, a loser failure if you don't play by the rules or go to school or do all those things. And, you know, to me, I was always interested in learning and I, I'm always, I've always been attracted to intelligence and I, um, I, I just was not interested in the way it was done where I was. And, you know, I, and I, I probably always been a bit of a snot in that way. Like, if, you know, no, you know, it has to be like this or just change, you know, to my, to my liking or to my will. So I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure that's why it's always hard for me to talk to young people. Uh, if I ever ask any questions, cause I, right. I don't quite know what to say. Cause I want half of me wants to say, do do it the way you want to do it, but I don't think everyone always succeeds in that. At the, Not everyone that always succeeds in that, but like everything you're saying is very much resonating with me. Not that I had that path at all, but I know a lot of people personally, and I'm older than you, who kick themselves at their jobs right now because they hate it. And if they would have just done professionally what they wanted to do at 25 years old instead of what their folks thought they should be, they would be in such a better place mentally right now. And they're, they have regrets over that. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm lucky to have had this experience or that experience early on to sort of show me a paradigm of that. You know, like I, I was at a young age conscious of the fact that uh, my parents' generation suffered the cultural and societal pressures of their parents' generation. And... I wasn't going to do that. I mean, to me, it was it was always sort of like, um, you know, it just to me, it was it it just didn't make sense to do that. You had to you have one life, you know, so you have to. I'm still at the age I'm at with the experience I'm at. I still deal with money in the same way I always have. So, you know, I'm still having these conversations with people just on yeah. a different, larger scale, perhaps than then. But, you know, and it's never good to uh, to worry about that kind of thing or to. But at some point. Early on, I just sort of made the decision that, you know, this is the one, my one life. And 
I'm going to, I'm going to go down in a blaze of glory, Good which is, you, you know, probably a single I had around that time. <laughs> right. Bon Jovi. For sure. I watched Good for you, lot. Josh. <laughs> the, seriously. That's awesome, man. And you know, you, it seems like you just, you never stop working. You're a busy guy. You mentioned Morrissey a bit ago. I have questions about Morrissey. I have questions about Eddie, but plural one, this is the show. This is your third full length. Um, when, it just came out recently, but when did you record this and with who? And we'll get, can I have a few details on this? Yeah, absolutely. The um, this this one was a strange one because it was born during the the pandemic. It was kind of begun as a band four person collaboration with um, the old band that I had before I joined the Chili Peppers, which was called Dot Hacker. Yeah. It was a four person band, and we hadn't done anything in a long time, and. We, we all four of us contributed to this song for our good friend that had a traumatic brain injury. So, okay. you know, it, and I remember, you know, because of the fact that there was a greater purpose at play for that song, there was zero um, opinion or artistic, you know, quibbling. Uh, everyone just kind of surrendered themselves and did what they could do to make the the project in front of them, the song in front of them better. And I remember, you know, so that was sort of the, where it was born. Let's, let's, the, let's do a, let's do a band thing. Let's get, you know, that was fun. Let's do that. And we kind of tried to come up with a, some ground rules and parameters and that was mainly it. Let's just, you know, let's, let's have a, f a workflow and just kind of try and suspend all the opinions and let's try it. Didn't work so well. But um, myself and uh, Clint Walsh, who was yes. a member of Dot Hacker, he and I just, he, uh, we were the ones in the past that maybe had the hardest time working together because we both play guitar. We both sort of, um, we're both in the same sonic register, let's okay. say, in the song. Yeah. So we had the hardest time maybe um, working together. Um, but we were finding this time around that we had a great time working together because of the growth in life that I've had and the growth in life that he's uh, gone through and all the experiences that we've both had. So that's how it began. So I, I got so excited about the idea of working with the that band again and just doing something that I wrote 10 things pretty quickly. Wow. And um yeah, it was it was kind of during the pandemic still, which I sound like a maniac when I talk about it, but that for me who would basically been felt like I'd been running around the globe working for 20 years straight. This was my first time off ever, you know, since, since basically meeting Bob Forrest. So you weren't going stir crazy at home. You kind of enjoyed, well, of course, horrible things happening in the world, oh, but you course. were enjoying I, yourself at being at home, just kind of kicking your feet up, but working on stuff. In, <laughs> just <laughs> fill it in the blank. I was so, just because I, for, for once, I, I was able to really focus on myself creatively and, you know, yeah. use some of the resources that I was able to um, amass through my time with the chili peppers and kind of just get, I mean, I was using equipment that I had never had the chance to really turn on yet, you know? So every day was a new, uh, a new sort of exploration for me of, you know, even if it was just writing a new song, I mean that I so often have something else to do or another responsibility that I, I can look at the clock and, and say like, well, I can, I can talk myself out of doing a demo for a song. Cause I know that in three hours <laughs> I got to go or, you know, yes. whatever it is. So, yeah. um, during that, I was able to write these 10 songs pretty quickly. And, um, oh, and then I just kind of threw them at Clint and said, here, go to town. Cause that's kind of how we had done the song that I'd mentioned before. Um, and then that freed me up to work with, uh, I was working a lot with Andrew Watt last year. We did a couple records together, including the Eddie, better solo album right yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so it was it was an amazing kind of experience to have this record here um being worked on and produced whilst i was free to go do the other thing and, and essentially it was because i was able to for once write something and have faith and trust in someone else's input and collaborative energy that i i kind of just let it let it go Ooh, and i've never done that before even in you know in other bands i'd been in it was yeah. always hard for me to just really have the trust in in other people or someone you know yeah. so but so even for me it was a, it was a big growth you know right. so it i was actually getting like off the whole time and you know even if even if it was uh you know the first thing i heard i was a little suspicious of all i had to do was take a deep <laughs> breath and listen another time 
and I was into it. And for me, you know, uh, it's very, I mean, for anyone, how rare is it to be doing something creative and really watch yourself grow? Totally. <laughs> at the same time. Good for you. You mentioned Eddie Vedder working on his solo record. How in the world, have you known Eddie for years? Like what was the <laughs> well, phone call? I've known text? Eddie for years. He hasn't known me as long. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> um, Earthling, his album, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and we, Let's see. I mean, I I met him a few times, very briefly along the way. Uh, the Chili Peppers and and uh, Pearl Jam finally sort of collided at Jazz Fest 2016, where they played on a. I think we played on a Saturday and they played on a Sunday, or vice versa. They were on Saturday, we were on Sunday. Um, but uh, we had just put out the Getaway, and um, Chad Smith and I had yeah. gone and done a interview with Mike McCready for the Pearl Jam radio station. So that was kind of one of the first weekends that we were just in each other's space more than, you know, just hello in passing. Um, hung out with Jeff Ament that weekend. We both went to see uh, Daniel Lenoir play with Brian Blade at, uh, at some, you know, a little venue in New Orleans. So just many kind of run-ins that weekend. I kind of, I remember joking with Eddie a little bit about airplane. We like made an airplane joke. The movie? As, yeah. Oh my God, we you're right, that's our second well, reference I think today. I was drinking uh, yeah. <laughs> as we were walking on stage and we were talking and I doused myself and I went, ugh, drinking problem. Right. <laughs> did he, he laugh? Oh yeah. And he that did. was, you know, <laughs> that was, that was a, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, airplane fans. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Do you think that so many of these musicians who have been doing it a long time, who are older than you, because of how good you are and the way you work, they are looking for someone to pass the baton to and to make sure that the music continues to be done in a way that they think is good and credible and their brain is in the right way. And they're like, they've been passing the baton to you since you were like 25, 26 years old? Well, uh, perhaps. I wonder if more, because it's, it's interesting, because I, I spent my entire 30s basically in the Chili Peppers. It was... Um, wow. I, I joined the year I turned 30 and left Amazing. basically right after my 40th birthday. So, um, yeah, I think I'm no longer at an age. I think the, you know, the baton I think the young, yeah, the, well, the younger generation would probably kneecap me and steal the baton from me <laughs> if I even managed to hold it for a second. But, uh, you know, I think but going back to your earlier question, I think maybe the older, these older people that I wound up playing with, I think they, you know, I think it's always, um, I think it's it's always kind of a positive or a, a beacon of light about when you see someone who's younger than you that you can relate to, that listens to music or appreciates any art in a, in a way similar to you, perhaps it mm, allows you to feel that the world isn't dying <laughs> right. because right. Yes. I, I think I tend to feel like that probably a little more than I should. And I feel like the world is perhaps, you know, getting or just becoming different to how it was when I was younger, quicker than it was maybe for them and me age wise. Yeah. You know, like when, whenever the internet came into, you know, kind of became prominent in the 90s i mean i feel like that was such a massive acceleration between how people experience the world uh different to how we did you know so yeah i mean perhaps just when they see someone that's younger than them that grew up appreciating music that they made and they trust my instincts when it comes to yeah. music or art or just any or, or or just life they don't think i'm a babbling moron you know i think it gives them hope that they did something positive in the world you know wow that makes total <laughs> sense are you able to sit back and appreciate what you've accomplished in your career so far or are you just always like i'm working i'm doing this i'm doing this i'm i'm still a very young person even in this profession because i mean man like I'm older than you, but I look up to you. Like, you yeah. have done it the right way and with such credibility and sticking to your guns. Thank you. Uh, that's um, very flattering to hear. I, um, <laughs> I'm only appreciating it a little bit now, I think. I mean, just, but mostly because, uh, that, because I've finally gotten to a place where I feel like I've 
given my own creative avenues a bit more time and a bit more care. There was a period before where the answer to that question would have been, no, absolutely not. You know, like, even in the Chili Peppers, that was a, an amazing honor and a wonderful experience. But creatively, it was very difficult. You know, y y a band of that size, they work on a schedule and, you know, you could write 500 songs, but you're only going to get to work on a couple of them every couple of years, you know? So it's, you know, playing in front of the audiences that band plays in front of and, and just hanging out with those guys. It's all a positive experience. But creatively, you know, it's sometimes difficult when you've got a lot of ideas and you want to work, 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 and just right. come up with new music. So I think I've only started to um, appreciate what I've accomplished recently and I think it's a combination of producing more work on my own which when I put out the first Plural One album uh, and was originally asked to go on this Pearl Jam tour there was only the one album now there's three yes uh, thanks to the pandemic and, and me <laughs> having all that time to make one last year or two years ago um, I mean very prolific one one a year is amazing yeah no I mean it was it was it was nothing but work for me uh, you know yeah so I think I've been able to appreciate it because I've been able to finally give myself some attention creatively. And then also I think now at, at uh, the age I'm at and the relationships I've been making recently with yet another band of people I look up to and respect. I mean, I finally can, I finally, it's harder for me to pass the buck and say, well, you know, come up with some ridiculous excuse. <laughs> I mean, I can finally be proud of the fact that, you know, I might be perhaps maybe a, decent enough person mm. that um, these people consider me a uh, friend, oh. <laughs> which is really all that I, I mean, I remember, I mean, that's kind of, that's another thing that I've, um, that I've always been lucky enough to kind of have, uh, and it's probably from a combination of things and experiences as a young person, but at a certain point, very early on, I just realized that it was all about friendship and connecting with people on a deeper level than just playing an instrument or you know the, the how you played or what you were able to accomplish it was about understanding people in a, an emotional way and that was that became my my sort of driving or my my organizing principle let's say when you're touring with pearl jam plural one you're playing your songs and you're busting your ass on stage but you're doing double duty you were doing double duty on this tour, right? You would play a set and be so celebratory, I bet, after your set. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Sometimes. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure almost every time. And then it's like, okay, refocus. Now you're going to play guitar with Pearl Jam on every one of these shows. Is that easy to do physically and mentally? Uh, yeah, well, mentally, I mean, it, it, it has been a bit of a, um, it's been a wonderful workout mentally to do it. Luckily my, especially guitar, yeah. luckily my workload with Pearl Jam is lighter than, you know, than it's been in other musical situations. Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't, I don't play the whole show. I, you know, I have, um, I, I, I generally don't play on songs early songs of theirs because they kind of they they got on fine without me yeah <laughs> i was mostly brought in to sort of cover some of the newer stuff oh particularly cool. the newest release they've had the gig and album. yeah 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 uh, on which i play every song i think i think i'm up. right yeah so um and i i love that m music and i love the record that they put out two years ago so um you know it's such an honor for me to be a part of that uh those songs, but then it grew after we didn't go on tour originally. Um, and then we did some shows at the end of 2021. So we've rehearsed now three times for the Gigaton tour. So my, my repertoire with them has grown. So I do play a little guitar here and there, play a couple little guitar parts on older songs. Um, but I'm mostly playing percussion and singing backgrounds. Nice. And, you know, a bit of keyboards here and there. Not much, but yeah. I mean, so it, it, it is you a wonderful a sort of juggle juggling act. Because a lot of sometimes it's like learn a song like that. And it's actually been great for me because I tend to over, just overanalyze things. Or if, if I'm let alone, you know, I might sit there and overthink my opening slot. But uh, we had an instance last the last week of this tour where... Matt Cameron sadly had to be right. left behind in Phoenix. So there was some drumming to, to uh, cover. And I mean, that was the, the 
I saw so clearly, like, wow, that when there's a greater purpose and there's something more important, I went up and had the most free uh, kind of, you know, just sort of automatic style opening set because I had so many other songs in my head and to think about. It. Then on, yeah. the, on the flip side, the <laughs> second night, um, I th- nothing was different. I just had a couple other songs to think about drumming wise, yeah. and my mind was a mess. Oh, uh, gosh, I couldn't no. remember my own lyrics, which is always kind of <laughs> hard the, for me for, anyway. For plural one, yeah, yeah. When you're out there. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, the thing about plural one, especially the older stuff, is that I never had the opportunity to play live. So I would make these records, I'd sing the songs, and yes. then I'd retire them, and then uh, most often I'd go back to the Chili Pepper or whatever uh, I was doing at the time. So learning my own songs has always been kind of a funny thing because I don't I'm, I don't have the uh, the chance to just hit the road with my band or whatever it is. So yeah, so my, my mind was a mess. I was singing wrong words. I was, you know, it was <laughs> but, but, but at the same time, like because of my playing with them and they're just being this sort of team attitude and we're all just, we're all in it together. Like I, I don't trip out about having a, you know, a, quote unquote bad show because it's actually not that bad I had that's another bit of growth I've had lately I, I I'm not you know I'm not saying everyone's like this but I like seeing that I like seeing uh, uh, someone on stage you know that hopefully you can clearly tell that their heart is in the right place and they do something interesting but I don't need to see perfection I want to see someone right. be a real person yes. in fact I don't I barely go to shows anymore because I just I'm kind of sick of the entire presentation you know i just i, I kind of would prefer seeing someone play in the parking lot you know <laughs> so rough edges to you are attractive yeah, you don't want something uh, too too perfectly smooth yeah i mean that second night in oakland was crazy but at the, at the same time uh the, not every very few people in that in that room know my song so i don't think they'd even tell i just could tell that my mind was a mess but um like i say it's like that there is no okay control i could have i could have uh I could have practiced all day long and it still may have happened because I had other things in my mind. I didn't think about my own performance for one second before I went on stage the night before wow. and it was great. Yeah. So I, I've really become interested in the way the mind works and the way you can let your, I mean, you know, it's many other people would probably, I mean, me five years ago would have probably wanted to, hide in a cave for a year after that second night in Oakland. But oh, wow. you, it's just all You've how you a pursue. lot, man. Yeah, it's, it's cool. all how you, you know, what you allow your mind to, to tell you or what you, what you, what you listen to and what you don't. For a while, you were the youngest person in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I think I and still then, am. Huh? I think I still am. Oh, you are? Yeah. I thought Elon Rubin... Is he in? He's in. Oh. I don't know. Do you two know each other? No, no, no. I know he played with Nine Inch Nails. He though, still right? does. He's been oh, playing. Okay. He's the played drums longer than anyone with Nine Inch Nails. And he's the drummer in Angels and Airwaves, Tom DeLonge's band. Oh, got it. Okay. And he's got some awesome solo music. And he's been in this chair. He's been on the show. And you guys have similar things going on. Very young prodigies, great at 15 years old, great at 20. Older musicians gravitate towards them. I think if you two went and got a cup of coffee... You would hit it off and maybe go make a song or two yeah, together. Yeah, let's do it. That's that's interesting. So he's in the yeah. Was, um, I don't pay attention much to the Hall of Fame because it's such a technicality that yeah. I'm in there. I didn't do the wonderful things. That ten the, year run though. That's that, great. Well, that's tr- yeah, but at the time I was, it was only a two year run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like a bit of a fraud being up there. But Aww. you know, they they. Uh, but yeah, no. I mean, it, to me, to me, it's kind of a funny thing to. Uh, to give awards for creativity like that. But obviously, um, obviously, you know, uh, everyone who's in the hall deserves it right. and um, deserves recognition, period. And just rock and roll or, you know, the, the thing that we all love deserves some... Uh, a museum. It's basically a museum. And, right, you know, right, rock and right. roll is basically over. <laughs> so, you know, or, you know, soon to be over, I feel Hopefully like. not. Hopefully not. Hopefully and I'm sure not. people will always be jumping around stages with guitars. I think it'll Hopefully, always... Hopefully, Josh. I just don't know if it matters the way it did anymore in the same way. You know, like there was a real cresting of what rock and roll did to culture and what it, how it spoke to power. And I think... That has been taken from us. So, you know, as sad as it is, you know, we just have to find something else or rock musicians have to get smarter. I don't know. (laughs) Um, Or we need to get more rock musicians in front of more young people 
Because there's not a well, then they if, if you go on TikTok, there's not. It's more. It's more. What's I say it again? Sorry. <laughs> the, the concert tickets are pretty expensive. <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. Absolutely. So I mean, and I don't. I actually don't. You know, luckily I haven't had to pay for anything in a long time. But uh, uh, concert wise, but you know, I feel like that's a that's a perfect example of why it's hard to to get people into rock music because the price the people that do go to rock music uh, yes. have to afford it. And then they're more likely the people that make their kids get a job that right. play rock music. That's a great point. <laughs> Cause you know, you don't want to be able to not afford the rock concert for your kids. Right, son. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I feel like once we get into that loop of money, 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 then rock and roll goes further and further, further away from the original core of what, it once meant to the culture, which is a bunch of, you know, natural, emotional kind of spirit yes. butting up against, you know, the way, the way stuff is. Right. Makes total sense. I don't mean to be a bummer. No, you're not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> um, I don't want to name drop here, but I was talking to Paul McCartney two weeks ago and he, I swear, he told me, striker. I'm not doing his impression. But he's like, <laughs> rock and roll's not dead. It's not, man. He's like, I've seen some artists, and maybe he's just saying that to inspire, but it inspired me that it's not hearing it from him. And I, I don't think he's out of it necessarily. Yeah, no. I mean, and he still he still rocks. He still he plays is. for like three hours. He's I, 80 years old. <laughs> he's 80 years old, man. Yeah, yeah no, and I've heard music he's done in the last, you know, year or two, just little things that he's that been you know worked on in studios yeah. and he's still he's still phenomenal totally um is it cool if i ask you a few questions about the chili peppers oh yeah because it's yeah. still somewhat recent and how do you feel mentally now i'm sure you're beyond grateful for 10 years toured the world you you, you wrote songs you, you played friendships you went from some people knowing who you are to everyone knowing who you are but how do you feel today uh i feel you know the the great thing is that um, I kind of feel the same as I did the in the in the seconds directly following them telling me that they had asked John to rejoin the band, and uh, you know that's not to say that you know there be a, there'll be a day or a night where it feel I feel a little you know frustrated or but I feel like the things that I'm frustrated about in terms of uh, them or in my time in that band were things I was frustrated about before I left. So about leaving um, and about everything that, that has gone on, you know, from when I've left or whatever it is, I kind of, I don't, you know, it's the same mentally. You know, obviously when you're, when you play music with people and on that level and you have those connections and those experiences, it's, it truly is like a family or like a brotherhood and it'd be impossible to, have that taken away or changed in any way without feeling the emotional strain of it. And I mean, and I think for me and all the, the growth that I've tried to make uh, or try to, you know, the work on myself I've tried to do in the past, you know, a little while is it, it's all about trying to feel that emotion more because I think I was sort of wired at a young age to really just move through it. And uh, so it's, I mean, even on the, even at, in the times where it feels emotional to me and I miss them or I, mm -hmm. you know, miss playing with them or whatever, that, that all feels good in a way because it's, uh, it's just something that I wasn't, you know, if anything, I mean, one of my, I, I used to, I used to reach for anger a lot quicker than, than mm. actual vulnerability or sadness. So I, you know, in these, in these instances, like the night they put out their record on the 1st of April, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a perfect story perfect amount of time that my record had come out on the 17th of March. So two weeks before them maybe. And then I was going to Seattle to start working with Pearl Jam again on this tour that yeah. just finished. So it was like the, the Valley between those two peaks. And I, I was just kind of at home by myself and, you know, just feeling a bit lonely, but oh. you know, I one and another one of the lonely making things about it is that it's just kind of a, it's a hard thing to talk to people about as I do it now with everybody out there. And, <laughs> but I mean, it's just, it's just an, it's a rare experience, you know, having, you know, people have been dismissed from bands for a long time and people don't see old friends as much. It, that's not, um, that's not uncommon, but just, you know, having, having, uh, having such a, such a crazy experience 
and then not having it anymore, but still being friends. It's just kind of a, it's a, it's a strange thing that I can't, that I don't find I can talk to many people about. So I was able to talk to a couple friends the following days uh, after their record came out. And, you know, again, just walked away feeling really grateful that I have the right. kind of mind that, that processes it in the way that it did. And I have, you know, some other great friends along the way who have made, who have made the whole experience just, you know, wonderful and make sense. And yeah, again, I couldn't be more grateful to them for all the experiences I've had with them. And, you know, my, as, as I've said, my only regret is just not, not making more music with them. Cause I thought, you know, if anything, I, the narrative that they, that they're pushing, that there was difficulty making music and that, you know, John coming back was, I mean, I, I, I just know from my experience that that's not, that's not how I would see us. I, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the whole story, you know? So, um, yeah, it's just a shame that more work wasn't, wasn't put into formulating the kind of relationship that would, you know, ma make for more music, you know? And I think, you know, there's, there's reasons for that. And, and, uh, yeah, that's so, that's so it. Who, who let you know that Josh is, we're not going to continue with you anymore. John's coming back. Oh, uh, the, the three of them were, were all there. Oh, they it were? Was, okay. Yeah, just, okay. you know, they, they do things in a very kind of brotherly way. And, um, but Flea's the one who vocalized it. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, uh, but I think I said this back then around the time, like I just kind of, I took him in and I had my eyes closed. I kind of just, I really tried to hold on to the love that I have for those guys. And, um, you know, cause if anything ever got, stressful down the road money wise or like because my you know my income went from what it is with them to zero at the time you know right. before I knew I was going on tour with Pearl Jam right. you know it was just basically taking someone's income from them you know on a dime so and I, you didn't ex you didn't know this was going to happen you had no idea that John was going to potentially want to be back part of this no no this no no there was a bit of like you know it's not like it was a monogamous uh, relationship or something, <laughs> but they, you know, they, they, Flea and John had been kind of hanging out and playing mm -hmm. and stuff. There, that was they, they were fostering that relationship again, and I didn't know that. No, it was sort of secret. And okay. um, no, I mean, I, I think I also said at the time, like I, I, I'm, I'm fairly perceptive, and I would know, I, I would think, um, I would consider myself someone that would see that kind of thing coming. But because we had worked so much on a new album we w we had put you know over a year into writing songs together i just kind of thought that we were gonna carry on making that you know that that music right your life was going to be chili peppers for quite a few more years so oh, yeah. what happens to those songs they just they're d d deleted in the computer saved in the yep, computer they're 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 on ice i guess as wow you but wow. There, yeah and which is a shame i think there was lots of good ones and uh yeah you don't need to hear this from me because you're in a great place mentally. You did great with the Chili Peppers, man. Those <laughs> albums you. are really good. The songs are great. I saw you play with them many times, and it was a freaking joy, dude. Thank you. You were great on stage. The chemistry looked amazing. So I'm just, I just want you to know, man, very, so much love for you. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. Yeah. No, I, I you know, I, I think um, if, if it had happened to, you know, that I was, that I was dismissed from the group five years before it did happen, I probably wasn't able yet at that point to deal mm. with it the way I am now. And I, I know, I think I can honestly say that I, I tried very hard to, uh, you know, formulate a, a relationship with all of them. And I think I did. And I think I'm their friend. I think, and that's kind of the most important thing, you know, musically, you know, I think John and Flea have a long and deep connection that yeah. comes back from when John is 17, 18 years old and Flea is, you know, in his late 20s or whatever. And their lives at that point are so different. And it's really all they care about is music and those connections. When I come along, it's there's there's so many more concerns and it's quite hard to to form a musical bond with a new person anyway. But especially when, you know, everyone in the band has kids and that we just don't spend the same amount of time playing, right. yeah. you know, all those things. And I, you know, it's like, I, if, if you're aware of all those things, like I said, I can be frustrated about it, but I'm not, I'm not frustrated at 
any of those guys. I'm just sort of frustrated that, you know, and I may have succumbed to this kind of thing uh, in the past more so, you know, feeling like a victim and, you know, like, darn, I, I, but it's, that's ridiculous. I just, you know, I wish, I wish it could have been, there could have been more music made. I mean, that's really all I care about. I have a lot, I'm, I'm very lucky in that way that I, you know, started playing with people at a young age. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty irresponsible when it comes to be, or I'm, I'm, I'm not really like a normal adult. I just never chose to live that way. So I can kind of be carefree in that way and just say, all I want to do is make songs. All I want to do is make music, you know? So yeah. I, and I spent a lot of time being friends with John when we were, when I was younger and you know, that's, that's kind of how he is too. So I'm, you know, he's, he's a very dedicated artist and musician and you know, we spent a lot of time together and we made records together and right. I'm sort of, you know, like, is that relationship in flux right now? I wouldn't say it's in flux. Okay. It's pretty non-existent. It is. Yeah. Damn, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> no. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's been that way for 10 years. So, I mean, I think at the time it was easy because, because yeah. he didn't know you were going to join the band. You guys were friends. He leaves and now it's like, Oh my God, here, here what, this guy, he, he knew, he knew there was talk about it before I joined. Cause Flea had asked me, there was lots of discussion about it in sort of the summer of that year. Yeah. But because of people traveling and just being on sort of summer holiday, we didn't actually make sounds together until October. So from July to October, I was in contact with John and he was in contact with them and he, he was having a hard time with the fact that they could even consider going on without him, you know? So I, uh, I, right. Yeah, right. But we were okay. still friendly. And until, I could see why he would think I could see that too. At the end of the day, you are extremely successful. They're extremely successful. Everyone's talented. There's room for everybody. You've got three records out, plural one. This is the most recent one again. You're on the road. You were just on the road with Pearl Jam. You play on an Eddie Vedder solo record. Yeah, life I is mean, good. Things, and <laughs> there's something we got to get to. We're almost like 50 minutes here. I can be long-winded. I'm sorry. No, you're not long-winded. These podcasts go long. Okay. But Josh, what is happening with you and Morrissey? <laughs> is there, are you guys playing? What? That is at least another 50 minutes. It is? Yeah. Give me, give me the short version. <laughs> you and Morrissey, do a lot of people know about this? Uh, well, I don't think they did, but they, I, it's little bits have snuck out okay. recently. So, but, I, but, I, but well, I will say though, I don't, I don't, I, I don't consider myself uh, a good <laughs> source for information on this topic because Sadly, this record that I made with him or was a part of was over a year ago and it's not out yet. So if anybody follows Morrissey or is a fan of his or yeah. if anyone knows anything about what's going on these days in the culture, they can sort of put two and two together and perhaps make sense out of why a great Morrissey album, you know, one that he said is his favorite. Whoa! Um, I, he said that in, in the NME, I think, or somewhere. So an album that Morrissey made that he is hailing as his best um, is not out yet. If that tells you anything about the struggle that he might be going through to get his music out mm -hmm. these days, um, that might be an excuse for me to say there's, there's enough going on around the release of this album that I don't feel... Um, like I'm the right person Fair to enough. speak on it. Fair enough. Although I will say I do have a lot of opinions about it. I do think it's a fantastic record and I think it should be out. And, um, y you know, I, again, like I, I think I, I'll, maybe I'll build the myth even bigger and get in trouble for it. But I think the whole story surrounding this record and the fact that it's not out yet, if people were able to um, sort of listen to the information and and kind of keep a cool head, they could see that there's a greater discussion around this album than whether than than the album or the music itself. And you know, so like I said, it could. It, I think someone should do a documentary about this album. I uh, I this. Wait, so is this biz more business related than creativity related? Is there a meant what? Mm. Okay, if you don't, it, well, I, I, no, I it's, get it's, it's cultural, and I would say it's oh. business in the sense that you know Morrissey 
uh, I don't know anything about his business affairs and his record la- and the record labels and stuff. But I'll, you know, I, I mean, Morrissey is has I think done himself no favors in the court of public opinion with some of the things he said or some of the right yes pins he's worn <laughs> on television and things. And you know, I honestly think Morrissey's a. Uh, um, you know, I don't think he's anything like what people accuse him of being. And I think he's, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm incredibly biased. I love the guy and have done since, since like I first saw him on the kill uncle cover. And I was like, that's the coolest guy I've ever seen. I, uh, you know, so I, I, I think, I think perhaps, um, he has, uh, not been able to appropriately, uh, communicate, what he thinks and feels about a variety of topics. And uh, that's not for me to even say that much, right. but I mean, I think this record that, uh, so my, who's on it? You Morrissey is Chad Smith. Yep. And so uh, you're playing guitar. I'm playing some guitar. So it's, it's basically just Chad Smith, Andrew Watt, myself, and Jesse Tobias, uh, and, um, and the man himself. And I, and I think it's an incredible record. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, there there should there should be a documentary about this this whole this whole project. But I do think, from what I've heard, the last the last thing I heard, it is going to come out. Would you go on tour with him full time if he asked you? If scheduling permits. Okay, if, sc- if scheduling permits. Okay, got it, got it, got it. I mean, I, I I would love to uh, I would love to spend as much time around Morrissey as I could, but you know, like. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know if either of us would benefit from that. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's another episode. It is. Hold on, we're 56 minutes. Wait, what's our? What are we going to 60? We can go whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I I don't <laughs> like to. People po- on podcasts, you can go as long as you want, but I like word economy. Let's get the facts. Let's have a good conversation. We don't need to talk just to talk. But if you got something right there, oh well, I've got I've got everything that goes on in this twisted mind of mine. But I <laughs> I can't uh, I can't I, I, you know, I don't I, want you to get in trouble for coming over to my house. But I also I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. Well, I, I mean, what I'll just say again, he has an amazing album okay. that he's sitting on. And I don't think he wants Come to be on, sitting on it. Um, I think people should hear it, and I think people are going to like it. Um, okay. You know, again, like I'm coming from my my experience of the world. I don't... I don't. Uh, I'm. Not, I don't spend a lot of time on the internet. I don't. You know, if Morrissey says something that's offensive to people, you know, like I. I don't know. Maybe it's. I don't know how much they know him. How much they know his music in the past. I don't know how much time they spend listening to his. Uh, like you know, thinking that they really know what he's coming from, uh, where he's coming from, I and mean, they people just might get offended. I, I don't, because I honestly don't think he's a, a malicious person, even if he says stupid shit, you know? Like, right. I I, uh, I don't always think he's, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I think I think he's incredible. I think he might not be as clever as he once was when it comes to, you know, dancing with the press, you know, and, and guess, sort of, yeah. and, you know, there's a difference between Morrissey of the 80s and the British press and, and now, and I feel like perhaps he's still trying to be the same sort of coy, you know, poetic character that he is. And, you know, it might not work in the same way. So if that's, that's the risk he takes by saying this or that, whatever. But I just ultimately don't think he's a, a bad person and, a, and has malicious and uh, prejudiced views. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 99.9% certain of that. If anything, he's, you know, he's got views that might be on in a certain way unpopular here or there, but uh, at the end of the day, you should be discussed and, you know, things should be, you know, calmly talked about. I mean, people shouldn't be written off or, you know, right. I don't want to even say that word. It's so annoying. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, the I just, C word. Yeah, the C word. Um, all I'll say is that, I mean, Morrissey has a great album and it's not out. And so what let's, does let's that, play what, a song. You have it in your phone. I do. Let's just play it into the microphone. I would love to. Okay. I'll, then I will get in trouble. But I will say Morrissey has a great record. It's in my phone. 
and it's not on on it's not in no, stores. Okay. What does that say about the world we're living in? Because where are we going to be 20 years from now? How many people will be making records or making songs that are supposed to make you think? Basically doing what I thought rock music or, you know, art in general was, which was to make you think, to start a conversation. That's what I thought we were supposed to do. How many people will be doing that or scared to do it in 20 years from now? If uh, Maybe more even see- five years from now. Yeah, exactly. So what, what kind of world are we moving toward? What kind of Orwellian or, you know, cultural void are we moving to where rock music or any music or any artist is scared to r- even write a song? I mean, Morrissey did some writing on this record that is so multi-leveled and just so thought provoking and so wonderful to me. I mean, whether you agree or not, I mean, I, I don't agree with a lot of things that people say, but you know, I, right. I think it should all be said, you know, I mean, the, the best, the best, uh, the best way to fight bad ideas is with, conversation and good ideas. And I'm lifting that from p- other people that I hear say that, but I mean, the best way to fight stupidity or, you know, you know, ill thought concepts is, uh, by having clear good ones yourself that you can, you can express and, and kind of have discourse over. So yeah, anyway, anyway, <laughs> I have part of an answer to the question. Where are we going? You know where we're going? We're going to world's going to a place where everybody has smooth edges and you can't get creative when you have a smooth edge. You can't be left of center with the smooth. Everyone's just going to be a robot. And we hope we don't get it to that point. We don't want to make anyone mad and make people feel bad. And by the way, this is not about Morrissey. What I'm saying here, if you're going to list 10 people that have said bad things on the internet in the past, I probably won't even remember what they said anyway. But if their actions have been bad year after year after year, now that I'm not in favor of. Yeah. Of Are you course. with me on that? Oh, yeah, for okay. sure. For sure. Let's wrap it right there. Shall we wrap it right there? Yeah, yeah, probably. Okay. Because another thing. <laughs> Josh Klingar for everybody. So I'm so pumped that you brought over CDs. This is the show, Plural One. Please investigate all of the music he has created. What a great career and what a dude you are man thank you so much thank you for being on thank you for having me over that was that was a real treat all right (laughs) guys thanks for thanks for watching another episode of tuna on toast for josh i am striker see you guys later hope you enjoyed now hit that subscribe button and for more tuna on toast listen wherever you get